listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Hi, this is John Stelsmiller, CEO of Fact Am I, and this is the Fact Am I podcast series. The achievements of any organization are the results of the combined efforts of every individual. Fact Am I was established in 2014 to increase awareness and enhance access to relevant and evidence-based drug information. This is the same mission that drives Fact Am I today. Happy 10-year anniversary to Fact Am I. Our host, Evelyn DeSantis, talks with medical information experts about the challenges of keeping up to date with drug info, consequences on misinformation in healthcare, and medical information as a resource, and the people behind this data from the pharmaceutical industry insiders. Welcome back to the Fact Am I podcast series. Uh, this is episode three in our series of four. So if you haven't listened to episode one and two, you will find uh, the links to the show no- in, in our show notes to episode one and two. And if you're driving, if you're walking and jogging, don't worry. Uh, just go to any of your favorite podcast apps and directories, Apple, Spotify, and you'll find um, the entire series throughout uh, the the latest episodes that we're publishing. We're also going to have a place on Fact MI to not only um, get the entire series, but also access more information. Evelyn, welcome back. I can't believe how fast this is going. It's all exciting. It's always exciting to talk with you. Thanks so much, Todd. It is exciting to talk to you as well. And I can't believe we're on episode three already. This has been great. So just for the listeners, uh, we were really jumping into the power of accurate drug information in episode one. Great conversation um, that, that you really staged and you were able to pull through some of the guest insights. Episode two was breaking into drug information, um, equally uh, interesting things in there that I had never heard of. So uh, listeners, if, if you if you want an understanding the transition from practice to industry, definitely listen to that episode. Now we're accessing accurate drug information. Evelyn, I think of our pharmacists out there in all settings. We're thinking of rare disease and long-term care, geriatrics, um, our, our pediatrics, and that accurate and, and being able to access this information is so important. I'm going to turn it over to you to welcome our guests and get us started once again accessing accurate drug information with Fact Am I. Thanks so much, Todd. And yeah, I have to just underscore how important that accessing information is. You know, when I was a faculty member, that was the one thing I always taught the students was that you you, you didn't have to memorize everything off the top of your head or know everything off the top of your head. You just had to know where to find it. So I think really being able to dig into that today is going to be helpful for practitioners in every venue. So I'd really like to thank our panelists today for being able to share their stories. So we have Indrani Carr, uh, who is at the University Hospital Health System um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Dan Avazia, who is at the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And Jen Riggins, who is at Fact Am I. So Guys, thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, if we could just go through and just share briefly about what your current role is, um, that would be great. Indrani, why don't we start with you? Sure. Thanks, Evelyn. Hi, everybody. I'm Indrani Carr. I manage formulary and policy at University Hospitals. We're a 16 hospital health system in Northeast Ohio. So all things from our adult and pediatric system formulary processes to working with our physician offices and ambulatory spaces for med management oversight and all things policy for drug related needs. So lots of needs for drug information in my role. Oh, great. Dan, how about yourself? Yeah, thanks again, Evelyn, for uh, having me. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm with the Ernest Marist School of Pharmacy a clinical associate professor there um, in drug information and medication safety. And so currently I direct um, a place that you very well know, the um, now called the MedU Safety and Information Center, the Legacy Drug Information Center here at Rutgers and Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health, um, you know, where we provide um, information of all kinds to um, both the system, the school, and the state of New Jersey. Um, in my role, I uh, 
serve as a preceptor for um, medication information fellows from Johnson & Johnson. I'm also the program director for a PGY2 medication use safety and policy residency program that is based here in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And we have, you know, countless numbers of, of students that, that rotate through learning, you know, practices of drug information and now med safety. And so besides the large teaching component that I have, um, you know, responsible for overseeing not only the, the, the drug information portion, but assisting both the hospital, the local PNT, and our now system formulary committee uh, with formulary management practices, med use policy, and medication safety practices. Oh, Dan, that sounds a lot. And yes, I had been at Rutgers as a faculty member and ran what used to be the Drug Information Service. Um, but it sounds like you really are taking it to that next level. Jen, I wanted to bring you in as well. Why, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Riggins. And I have had a long career in the pharmaceutical industry in medical information. And um, about three years ago, joined the Fact in My organization as the partnership and technology strategist. And so I work to develop partnerships with other third party organizations that um, we're trying to get our tools and technology um, in partnership with. So working with healthcare associations, um, pharmacy organizations, EMRs, those types of, of groups. So we're looking at, at doing some great partnerships. Wonderful. And, and we will definitely be digging into that technology a little bit later in the podcast. So really to start off with, I want to, you know, kind of pick your brains, both Indrani and Dan, about what have been some of the real world examples that you have faced and challenges on finding accurate information to help you navigate the various situations in healthcare that you face? A lot of the scenarios we run into are off-label needs or things that may not have a lot of information published, but we'll take anything we can get, even case reports or case series or information that our pharmaceutical company colleagues have not published, but are available when we call our meta info lines. So one of the examples, two examples I'll go through recently that we dealt with, we're thinking through biosimilars all the time, good cost saving opportunity, good thing to look at from a formulary standpoint. And when we're trying to understand the usability of a biosimilar, there may not be many clinical studies. That's not how they're approved through the normal FDA process. There may only be one indication that's clinically studied, but there may not be in other areas. And so when we're evaluating for our pediatric patients, we really need to dig into the PK and PD information to help us understand if it's appropriate in those patients. So that's something that I've really looked for data on, and we've had to call for that information in the past uh, because it's not always published on the FDA site. That's usually my first go-to for information, um, but then we also will call the med info lines, which have been very helpful for that kind of information. The other scenario we ran into was when we were evaluating the new RSV vaccine for our maternal patients, the Abrisvo vaccine compared to nirsevimab, so any babies who receive the nurse of Amab and if mom needs a Briswell and what does that look like and what's the information around that. So that was something that was published in a lot of different areas like information from ASIP and CDC, as well as a lot of company content that helped us implement both products last season. And even better, we have more information for this season, which is helpful. So those are two examples of things where we've had to gather information in I think very different ways, and it just shows that content is available. You have to know where to find it, like you said, as well as what to ask when you can't find something. And that usually gets us further down the road. That's great. Thank you. And, and I think those are two great examples of where, you know, the way that we normally find information works probably about 80% of the time but it's that other 20% that we really need to dig in and figure out how else we can find that information and being able to realize 
what are some of those resources, like being able to use the pharmaceutical uh, medical information contact centers as one aspect. Dan, how about you? Yeah, uh, I like how Andrani said, getting further down the path, because it, it very much is the journey versus the destination, because I think all of us uh, you know, today can understand that, that it's very hard to get always that exact answer that we want and find that exact piece of information. You know, I, I'm sure all of us have have shared at times with our learners, you know, be comfortable, especially when you're in this setting, be comfortable in the gray area, because that is, you know, definitely where we like to navigate. Uh, the black and white is, uh, especially the questions we get are, are it's often not there. And, and because we now live in a world where getting that black and white information generally is, is easier than it has been. But, you know, for me, in terms of real world examples, um, one area that, that we, the, the number of questions from our kind of call center um, and, and electronic request system that we receive most commonly at our location, um, at least 50% of the time, if not close to 60, are questions related to a very unique allergy, um, alpha-gal syndrome, right? The mammalian meat allergy. And I think some of us discussing, you know, we, uh, are, I'm only chuckling because it is kind of taken over the, this, this, this center that I, and my, my team. Um, but, you know, being a relatively rare condition, that is evolving, and, and you know, as we, as especially over the past year, that CDC now recognizes as a threat, as a vector-borne illness that can translate into this allergy. There's not a lot of information about um, not only just what causes it, but especially from our standpoint, the what's contained and inactive ingredients within medications that could then elicit a a allergic response, and so. Every week, we are contacting medication, medical information centers throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, you know, updating a database that we have, um, and and really, you know, leaning on those resources from from the industry because sourcing ingredients and that information is not readily available, both you know from the companies and even through the FDA. And so, you know, that's one area in particular that we struggle with. Um, but having resources like FactMI and other areas where we could directly interface has been a huge help. The other piece is is um, you know drug shortages and and navigating not necessarily the shortage itself that's generally apparent, but now what do we do right? If we have a product that we cannot get and we need to manage you know our patients in other ways, how do we quickly get information that will support use of another product or another agent um, in the same class or another class. And so those are areas I'd say over the past year, certainly I have, um, you know, needed accurate information quickly. I think those are also some great examples, but actually I want to dig back onto something you said about being able to find, you know, a lot of times the answers are not just black and white for what, you as a drug information specialist get and what Andrani gets. Um, but for a lot of healthcare professionals and a lot of pharmacists, sometimes the answer is just in the label. And it, you know, we all know what those labels look like. <laughs> we, we know how difficult it is to sometimes read through the entire package insert to find that information. So a lot of times just even the black and white answers can sometimes get a little bit more time consuming to find um, the full information. But you're right. You know, when we get into those more oddball cases or what I guess used to be oddball, but now it sounds like it 50 to 60 sounds like a majority of your questions. And <laughs> as the legacy director, um, I'm sorry. Um, but you know what? No, no harm. There are times that, you know, you're wondering, will I ever get a question that's not alpha gal related, but in the end, we are helping out a lot of people throughout the country, which is which is pretty cool. So, and and that's one of the things I always thought that was really cool about that was you know you have become the expert and are helping not only patients but pharmacists who get that type of question and are you know they don't know where to turn next. So it's great that they can turn to you, Jen. I want to bring you in 
on this as well. You've been with Fact of Mind now for a little bit, uh, for a little while. Can you provide us some of the historical perspective on the evolution of the drug information portal as a resource on Fact of Mind? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just to, to bring it full circle with some of the examples that, that Dan and, and Johnny have, have talked about here is we started out with this thinking about how could we bring together the resources that would be helpful to healthcare professionals as they're trying to answer questions. And so being able to pull together all of those company contact center information, you know, how do I get a hold of company X? How do I get a hold of company Y? What are the, all of the phone numbers, the, the um, chat services, the websites, can I get all of those in one single location so that I don't have to keep looking and searching for how to get a hold of this particular company? And so as we were thinking about what would be a great one-stop shop website or a drug information portal, which we now today are calling the drug information database, it, those things were major elements of our strategy back in 2013 when we started ideating around what this could look like. Um, so there were 19 pharma companies that came together and started creating this, what would be this drug information database. Um, we started thinking about how could we um, get the information and the format and the channel preferences that HCPs would want and be able to provide this information to them. So we used a phased approach. We started with um, that common database of all the ways to reach an individual pharma company medical information team. I just wanted to add in that back in 2013, when you guys put together that list of how to access not only the phone numbers, but at that point, the up and coming websites that the drug information, the medical information um, departments were putting out there. As a drug information specialist, as a faculty member, I was, you know, singing those praises. That's what first got me, you know, acquainted with the fact of my website. And I just thought that was an amazing resource. And I just had to put it out there. You know, we could, I could find the telephone numbers pretty easily. It, there were different places. It was nice to have them all in one place. But to find those MedInfo websites, oh, that was an answer to prayer. I just needed to throw that in there. Yeah, I'm glad you added that. I think that's, uh, that's a, a great comment to hear um, because I think it has been really useful. So that's how we started. We put those, those pieces of, of critical information together first and foremost, and we got that out. And then we started to add package labels. And so for all of our member companies' products, as well as every product that's been approved by the FDA eventually, we have made all of those available through the Fact of My uh, Drug Information Portal so that they're searchable. All of those package labels are searchable. And um, you can find those, those black and white answers that, that you were looking for and that we, we've talked about earlier as well as then in the next phases, we've started adding scientific responses. So answers to questions that each of these companies um, receive frequently about the products that, that they market and making those available in a, in a searchable format as well. So I think those are, are really the, the big pieces that are a part of the drug information portal. And I think the next step that we'll be thinking about then is how do we bring patient information on board here? And as companies are making those resources available more and more, we'll have both HCP information as well as patient information available through this website. That's great, Jen. And, I, and I'm so appreciative of all the advances that we've been able to do with that. Um, Dan, I'm going to throw it back to you. Have you been able to utilize... Um, anything on that portal for responding to any of the questions that you get faced with? Yeah. Yes, I have. Um, and really in two major ways. Number one, as just an actual resource to get information, it's been helpful when, um, you know, kind of an off, maybe an 
off-label question has come up regarding a product, and again, not just AlphaGal, you know, whether it's stability, information, or, um, you know, adverse effect, uh, that is one of the places that we will go, especially when we're like leaning towards needing information from the manufacturer. So, so to answer, yes, um, I've certainly used it and I'm trying to share that with our, with our learners. And that's really the other piece is using it as a teaching tool um, to, to share about other sources of accurate referenced information um, regarding drugs and then to assist, you know, soon to be pharmacists or actual pharmacists or soon to be clinicians um, in, in this practice and just their day-to-day -day activities. Um, so it's been really a, a, a helpful resource and to your, knowing, getting the history has been helpful to know, you know, really where we've gone and understanding. I think a big piece is that we often, I say we collectively, um, forget that, you know, our pharma partners have quite a bit of information on their products. And having kind of a one-stop shop is is really nice to know and and share with with other practitioners. Just to add in to that, um, I think it's great that you're using starting to use this as a teaching tool. I think awareness is a a big area where we need to um, put some efforts around increasing awareness of resources that pharmacists and other healthcare providers can access to get drug information questions answered. And so as we as we hit those pharmacy students and medical students, et cetera, and make them aware of the resources that are available to them, such as the drug information database or even drug information centers themselves um, in being able to get answers to the questions, I think it, it really benefits patients um, in the long run. To Jen's point, I've used the portal mainly as a teaching tool so far. A lot of questions I end up having for now are with manufacturers that are not in fact MI yet, but I'm really happy to hear that it's continuing to expand and has more companies involved because that will make it even more usable as we continue to use it. But I've used it as a teaching tool with my students and my residents as another resource, another place for us to utilize when we have questions and trying to navigate because there, we have to face it. There are more pharmaceutical companies than there are individual pharmacists taking care of patients in terms of products that are out there. There's nonstop information that we are having to navigate to find and then digest. So having a place that helps to do that, in addition to many other resources that we need to teach to and use and be proficient in is very useful. I would agree. And and knowing that there is a place, you know, one, you can get the that in-depth information, kind of the stuff that only the manufacturer has in those scientific response documents, but also knowing it has all of the package inserts. So and searchable with a layout that as I've played with it, I think can actually be an easier way of getting some of that label information than some of the other resources out there. Jen, I wanted to just um, circle back on something you said earlier about kind of where the drug information portal from Factomai may be going. You mentioned a little bit about getting some patient information on there. You want to expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. So we feel like that um, as the consumer becomes more and more engaged in, um, you know, championing their own health care, they're seeking information. And we want them to have access to as many credible sources of information as possible. And uh, many of the medical information groups are starting to be providers of some of that information to patients, along with obviously the brand teams and, and that sort of thing. But there are a number of questions, just like healthcare professionals have that consumers have directly um, to the pharma companies. And so we're working to make those resources available in um, plain, plain language, easy to digest information that helps um, a patient better understand 
um, a product that they may be taking or perhaps a disease state um, or a disease state and product combination? I think that's great. And I think that also kind of as we continue to build that awareness, it's a, it's a place where healthcare professionals can go to get information to be able to give to their patients. So not just from accessing it as a patient, but actually accessing it as a pharmacist. When a patient asks you the question, you know, potentially you can go there, you can point them there, you could go there yourself and be able to get them that level of information. Knowing that Factomai Drug Information Portal is one of the resources available. Um, throwing this back to both uh, Dan and Andrani, what would your most salient piece of advice for accessing drug information be? I think Dan and I covered this, but it is worth repeating. It's something I'm sure all of us have taught our own students and residents. Dr. D taught me this when I was one of her residents. Depending on the question, you have to know the first source that you're going to navigate to. And then after you've navigated to a resource that you know will get you the majority of whatever question you're dealing with, what are those next levels that you'll work down towards? Many times we don't have resources that answer all of our questions. Many times we do, but sometimes we don't. And we have to know about the content we're looking for and try to navigate to those resources. I think that's the main thing that has helped me along the way, knowing my sources of truths and going after them. Yeah, I, I agree, Andrani. Um, those having those sources of truth are are key, right? And and I think a lot of us have learned as as we went through our schooling and training to start building that library, if you will. You know, early on, I think all of us could probably name, you know, go through a list of what our sources of truth are initially. Um, so to wholeheartedly agree. And I think now, as I think about this question, Evelyn, is, you know, in this, as we see AI to, you know, not take over yet, I hope, um, become more of a part of our professional lives and personal lives, it's so easy to get information. I mean, it has been, right, with internet access, but even more so to, to prompt something to get the information that, that you're seeking. Um, it's even more important that I kind of take the advice of my father, right? And just building something, but, you know, a project, which is measure twice, cut once. It's still not only knowing the source as a Johnny's point, but checking at least two of them before giving a response. Again, it's so tempting to type a prompt into chat GPT or perplexity or whatever your preference is and get a resource and then give that information because it's quick, but but really making sure that we understand that this, you know, it is a source of truth and, and making sure we're giving accurate information, especially in this day and age where information is needed quicker and quicker, seemingly every day. And to just add on to that, you know, not only is information needed, we're running not only the 24 hour news cycle, but healthcare runs 24 hours. So needs are 24 hours. So yeah, so having an, a place that you can access, we want that information faster and faster. Yes, I think AI has opportunities, but knowing that it can pull from the universe of data, I think that also leads us to into probably a whole nother series of podcast topics right. we did at that. episode four right. disinformation and disinformation that's out there you know the fda's recent guidance on allowing companies now to be able to address that misinformation right. and you know part of that whole guidance is understanding the difference between opinion and personal experience which everybody has their right to but then providing misinformation. Mm -hmm. I think that is just something to understand that is so critical. And yeah, I, one of the things that I always taught and I'm sure you teach and Drani teaches um, and echoed that you look in two places, you, 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 you look one place, you get one answer, you get one opinion, 
but you need to double check that and look into because we have so often we have seen this time and time again with some of my go-to resources when I was in practice had one answer, but then you look somewhere else and it was a, it was a different answer. So then you're left going, okay, why do these two well-established resources tell me something different? So I think being able to check multiple places is so, so important. And knowing what those accurate resources are. We all have those go-to, you know, tertiary compendiums that we go to all the time. And I think hopefully being able to add the fact of my portal into that your go-to resources for labeled information, but then also for those scientific response documents can just you know, increase your toolkit. Um, as we start to close out this podcast, I just wanted to re review some of the key takeaways based on our conversation um, to make sure we hit the objectives laid out for this podcast. So we have discussed some real world challenges and how information helped navigate those situations. Um, both Indrani and Dan, you gave some great examples um, of that being everything from understanding issues coming up from formulary to answering patient specific questions um, with allergies and stability information. And we also described how to access the information from the FactMI drug information portal, that that is just on the website. Um, a couple of clicks, you're into the portal, identifying yourself as a pharmacist or healthcare professional, and then really being able to select a drug or type in a drug, uh, drug name, and, and then being able to type in a question to be able to access that you know, information, whether it's, again, the label information or a response document information. With that, I would like to just, again, thank you guys so much for your time today um, and throw it back to you, Todd. All right, Evelyn, thank you so much. What an interesting conversation. This is the third part of our podcast series, Empowering Healthcare Decisions. Um, today's discussion was around accessing accurate drug information. Stay tuned. We are coming out with episode four, and it's going to be a collaborative approach to medical information. And how involved, and you as a pharmacist listening to this right now, how involved you can become in building new drug information, reliable, accessible. Reach out to the FactMI team. That's FactMI. That's fact with a P-H-A-C-T-M-I dot org. And um, hey, thank you so much for everything you do for public health, uh, keeping our um, people safe throughout our nation. Evelyn, thank you and, and uh, thank you specifically uh, for, for running this. This has been incredible and uh, special thanks to Fact Am I. Thanks, Todd.